Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Postal Mate webinar, International and CMRA Changes Effective Today, March 1st, 2023. My name is Karen Grant, and I'll be your instructor today. We have a record number of people signed up for this webinar. Um, it was just short of 1,400 stores signed up for this webinar, which when you consider that's almost half of all the stores in our customer database, that's amazing. So thank you for joining us. Welcome if you're new. Uh, we will get started right away. I just want to point out to you that if for some reason in the future you can't make a webinar but you signed up for it, you don't have to let me know. You don't have to ask for a recording. Everyone who registers for the webinar is emailed a recording as long as the recording actually technology works for it, and it almost always does. Um, you will be emailed a link late in the same day so that you can watch it at your leisure at home, on a tablet, on a phone, phone's hard, but any way you want. It doesn't have to be at your store. I know you're open, I know you have customers, so I can really appreciate that. So just know all you have to ever do is register for one of our big webinars and you will get an email later in the day. We're gonna get started right into the meat and potatoes as usual. So, um, Indicia labels are now missing a barcode and I wanted to start off with this because it has nothing to do with the topics today, but I wanted to address it because it, a lot of calls are coming into our support team on this. So some first class inter mail international labels are being printed without a barcode and that is a change by Indicia mandated by the post office. It is correct. Um, the issue or the problem with it is, I mean, there's no real problem except it looks weird, right? And it looks different. If you have to do a refund, you'll have to contact Indicia to do that refund. Refunds through Postal Mate for post office can only be done same day before carrier pickup with a barcode. So when there's no barcode um, or it's not the same day before carrier pickup, you have to go through Indicia to get that refund. So just a heads up on that. I know it looks weird, but um, it is legit, guys. So, let's see here, come on, why is it being a pain? There we go. We're going to start off with this little thing called the EORI. Now, FedEx initiated letting stores know about this a few weeks ago. Um, we got a lot of calls on it. The other carriers have casually followed suit, meaning uh, UPS and DHL has given a little information. DHL not so much, which is really interesting because they're usually on top of um, all international changes. But And then the post office has issued some information about changes, but not this specific one. But let me assure you, this affects all carriers. This is a rule for these countries. This is not a carrier rule. These are laws by the country. In fact, it's the European Union um, for the most part, UK. We'll talk about what countries it is in just a moment. So what is it? It is called the Economic Operators Registration and Identification Number. We're still trying to figure out everything that it involves. And let me tell you, there's a lot of conflicting information or information on websites out there that's partial. And then you go to another one and I found, oh yeah, it's that plus it's this. Oh yeah, and it can do this. So I did a lot of research into this to give you the best available information. It is issued by the EU and the UK. They are not the same. So UK has its own system from the EU because they're not together anymore, but they do operate very similarly. Um, it is for uh, commercial shipments. It's only for trade. It has nothing to do with gifts. Gifts, you don't have to worry about this. So the UK, EU, Norway, and Switzerland now require this um, number. It usually belongs to the receiver and for and it's when you're sending a shipment for trade. Okay, commercial sales and samples are both included in this. So if you're sending a samples of I don't know, ceramic tile, I always like to use that one because I'm in the Southwest, uh, to somebody in Italy, that's going to require an EORI number. Um, so that kind of a, a thing is what you're looking for. If you have a customer that regularly trades with that country, they also could have an EORI number. And this is where it gets really, there's just really not good information out there. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some best practices, so hold on to your hat. Um, so it is possible that your customer in the United States has an EORI number for them. It's also possible that the receiver would have an EORI number. So it is entirely possible that you could have two EORI numbers in the same shipment. 
I think it'll be fairly rare. In fact, I think it'll be re really rare that you will have customers with an EORI. But I was just in the Orlando um, regional and I had people tell me that they do have commercial shippers that ship frequently to the EU. In fact, they were using customer samples as one of something that they frequently ship. So you, if you do a lot of commercial shipping, uh, you may run into this more than the typical store that doesn't do a ton of that. These are the countries an EORI number is required for. Everything in black is the EU, okay? Everything in white is also. <laughs> so the EU plus Norway, plus Switzerland, plus the UK, which includes England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Now, you'll notice that some of these countries are bold. And those are countries that tend to be more particular right now. So I've read um, about the EORI. And having said that, what's the best practice for the stores? And I'm just gonna go through, guys, I do not want you losing sales over this. And I do not want you having a heart attack over this. The fact is that these numbers will become part of our, our regular practice. But initially, um, we're still trying, everybody's still trying to figure out what they are, when they're needed, what they're used for. So technically by the book, if you send a package to, let's say, Spain, and it requires an EORI number of the receiver and you don't have it or your customer doesn't have it, there's no way for you to really look it up right now. And that's not your job. It is your customer's responsibility to have this number. So if so, we'll get to that. If they provide it to you, great. And if they don't, still, I'm, my recommendation is to still send the shipment. Now, again, technically, what happens when it gets there is it will be held. You'll be notified it needs a new, uh, uh, needs a ERRI number, and you'll have an opportunity to contact your customer. It's not thrown away. It's not going into quarantine, and it should not be returned to you. And I say should not because you never know what a carrier does, right? But technically, it should be held for that number. In the beginning stages, I don't think that they're going to do that. They might send it through with something saying, you know, lacking EORI. They may just send it through regardless. This could be a passive regulation, meaning it's a regulation on the books that they only enforce for bigger commercial shippers um, and don't let the little ones go through. But it could not, it could be something they're really rigid about and get really rigid about. And it's they demand it immediately. So we will, as we go on, we will learn more about this. I highly predict that in one or two or three years, we'll have a webinar where we'll address this because we'll see by then how all this has worked out in practice. Right now, it's just legislation or law. Um, now we'll see how it works out in practice. By the way, the EORI numbers are not really new. They've been around, I wanna say since 2009, I think is when I heard they started coming into, into place. And they actually became a regulation to be used in 2021. It's just that the enforcement is not happening until now. So um, if you've heard about them in the past, uh, congratulations, because they were pretty new to me. <laughs> so and I think I'm up on most of this stuff. So the best practice for the stores, here's what I would recommend, is that when you get to the, uh, to the screen for customs, if you select not a gift, that would be a really great time uh, to ask your customer, do you have an EORI number? And we all know what your customer is going to say. A what? Is that something I have to have? I don't know what that is. You know, it, it's going to happen. But you doing your job by asking for it is good. Um, I think that's really, really important that you at least ask for it. Um, in Again, in time, we'll figure out together. Um, and and I, I hate to say it, but eventually somebody, one of you probably is going to have a package held for the EORI number and you're gonna call me or email me and say, hey, Karen, I had one of those happen and here's what the procedure was. And we will learn from you. Um, we will learn through trial and error because uh, unfortunately nobody's coming to us and saying, here's how it's done. Here's what you need to do. So we'll, go, we'll muddle through this together, guys. So what does an EORI number look like? Well, it is composed of like between 10 and 15 numbers with the country abbreviation in the front. 
So I, here's an example from UK, and I was kind of guessing that France is FR. I think that's their legal abbreviation. So that's kind of what it would look like. There's no really rhyme or reason as to how many numbers, like I said, between 10 and 15 after the country code. Um, and they can be interchanged as far as I'm aware. Now, again, having said that, UK is not part of the EU. So could you use... Um, you know, I, what I'm saying is if you have one, an EORI for a package um, going to Spain, but the country's EORI number is an FR, that's okay. Okay, they don't, the EU is considered one entity. And so if, if one with any two letter abbreviation in the front should work. The question is if they have a UK EORI and it's going to Spain, will it work? And I don't have an answer for you on that. Um, my guess is we won't have too much of that, but in fact, my guess is that none of you are going to deal with this at all this year. My job is to make sure you know what it is, right? Because who knows if it does become enforced or something we have to do, you, you guys got to know. So then once you get the EORI number, when you do, you're going to need to manually place it on the customs form. I'm going to encourage you to put it up where either the if it was the senders you'd put it at the sender but um this in this case it's the shipper and just handwrite it in there we're not going to create a place to put it to type it in at this time in postmate partly because um it wouldn't be consistent we really like being consistent and we can't force that with you usps for example um indicia we don't Indicia creates the labels um, and that has the customs form on it. So um, we're going to have you just hand write this over time. We'll see if we need a place, if the carriers require a place, but for now you'll be handwriting it. And again, it's only those countries. So it's only European Union, Norway, Switzerland, and the UK. So what happens if you don't ha ha add the EORI? Like I said, it could be held uh, until they get one. Don't think that's going to happen much, but hey, prove me wrong. If you, if you, and this is on you to make the whole group better. If you learn something different, or if your experience is something different, especially as time goes on, initially they may pass through, but starting in a few months, they may start cracking down. Please let me know your experience so that I can share that in a webinar. Um, because I can't get that from websites. I can't get that from studying. I can't get that from researching. I get that from you guys. So help me out with that, please. Um, again, best practice for, for stores, how about having a disclaimer or, at, or adding to your disclaimer, your shipping disclaimer in CashMate? Um, I'm gonna, this is an idea, this is only my suggestion. Please, please reword this to your heart's content, uh, improve on it. This is, if you wanna take a cell phone picture or a screenshot of this, do that now. Um, but this was kind of along the lines of an idea of how you could, what you could put in your disclaimer. Um, but you create your own, you do you, as they say. That's a new saying, right? I'm old. All right, commodity description changes. This is the next international change. So we've ta actually talked about this in the past. This has been coming around for years and years, and I've been preaching it for the last several years, but now it's being mandated and enforced. And that is having better descriptions and this is especially important going to um, certain countries, but it is very, very important really for all countries. So these changes again take place today. And this is where um, all outbound shipments need to have some really good descriptions, uh, including APOFP, FPO, DPO. So we're really bad sometimes. And it's in the old days, you used to be able to send things to a, a military person and just say personal effects or personal clothing. You can't do that anymore. It, it's really got to be spelled out. So make sure that you're very detailed. Um, this is Karen's rule. This is not a legit rule. So remember, yeah, this is Karen's rule. I've got it down here in the bottom right hand corner. See that Karen's rule? Karen's rule is to use at least three words to describe every item. Now, you don't have to follow Karen's rule. But it's more likely that you won't have any issues if you're trying to describe it well. There's some times where you just don't. An iPhone is an iPhone. You don't have to use more. But I like 
a, a new iPhone um, or a used iPhone, uh, no issues or whatever. So those kinds of things. Keywords, new or used, because used textile items like clothing or bedding um, very, very often cannot be shipped to, to many countries. The, con the contents or the, the fabric, textile, or um, other contents. So if it's a, um, a picture, if it's a picture in a frame, is that frame plastic? Is that frame wood? Um, if it's wood, some countries are going to require a certificate of origin. And that just makes sure that that wood was did not originate from a country that they don't do business in, in or don't won't deal with. So weird things like that. The type of contents, um, and then further, here's some ideas here. So instead of the the items on the left, toys, you try new plastic toy truck. That's four words. Shoes, new men's leather shoes. Pictures, family photo album, a wallet, new empty leather wallet. Empty is important. They don't want you sending credit cards a lot of times and stuff. New iPhone 14 or clock, new LED digital alarm clock. Now, would you all agree that these things are things that you would ship in your store to somebody? I mean, these, these are all a possibility, right? Having said that, looking up to make sure that things can go to the country you're sending it to is really important. Here's why. You're going to love this. These things, not one of them is allowed in Italy. Not one of these items can you ship to Italy. If you don't look up and make sure that the contents of your package is allowed to go in that country, shame on you. You're doing your, your customers a disservice because you're the professional shipper. They come to you and you make a good profit on international shipping if you have it set up correctly. Um, on a shipment, if I was sending all of this stuff to somebody in Italy, it's probably a couple hundred dollar sale and I'm probably making over a hundred dollars profit, right? Well, if that's true, I should be doing my due diligence in making sure that the items are actually gonna get there. So you might be asking and I'll give you um, a hint on where to go. Make sure you have a pen because I don't have this on a screenshot. Um, the best place to see easily, quickly, what items can go to what country is, what, here's what you'll Google and here's what you'll write down. USPS index of countries and localities. Find that and bookmark it. I'll repeat it one more time. USPS index of countries and localities. Um, the country rules should be generally the same for all carriers. It's just that the post office has it really easy to find what items are and are not allowed to ship, especially what are not. Um, so that makes it really easy. Next item, harmonized code. This is also known as the tariff code. Different carriers might call it a different thing, but harmonized code and a tariff code are the same identical thing. Enforcement starts today. We've already had it in Postmate. You get a mean little message up every time you do an international shipping asking you, and it doesn't matter where you're shipping to, asking you if you'd like to enter the harmonized code. You can always bypass the harmonized code, but starting today, the carriers will reject your label in some circumstances. In other circumstances, your item might get held if you don't include the harmonized code if it's required. So the question is, um, how do you find it and when it, where is it required? So in Postalmate, we have the harmonized code right down here. There's a harmonized code lookup and that'll take you right to the website so that you can look up the harmonized code easy peasy. Um, that has been in Postalmate for, I wanna say 15 years. So it's been there forever and ever. A lot of people just don't know it's there. So you can use that to look up the harmonized code. The harmonized code is required for these countries at this time. It is all of the EU plus Norway plus Switzerland. Now, if you want to do the harmonized code for other places, that's perfectly fine. In fact, those countries thank you because it makes um, assessing the tariffs so much easier for them. So if it's going to Japan or Brazil or Kenya or um, any of the other places, that's great. 
but it's required for these countries. And I did have somebody email me earlier today and said that their label was rejected for the reason it didn't have the tariff codes and they called it a tariff code. So it can be called a harmonized code or a tariff code. I'm guessing that this is the reason that they did not have the harmonized code. Harmonized codes are also required for an APO, FPO, DPO. If the receiver is in one of those countries, okay? I know, wow, you just went, wait, what? How do you know where you're, the soldier or sailor is serving, right? You're gonna have to ask your customer now. That's ne We've never had to do that. Somebody comes in with an APO address, we treat it as domestic, even though we have to fill out customs forms. Well, now you have to be specific about the contents. And if they're stationed in Germany, in Spain, in Romania, you're going to have to have the harmonized code and add that as well. And so that's new and um, will be enforced. Now, some of you are going, nah, uh, I don't believe her. So because I knew you would be on this webinar, here it is right from the USPS website. So I want you to know I didn't make it up. I don't make things up, at least not too often, guys. So you will need the harmonized code. So get practice in entering the harmonized code. Again, you don't have to have it for all. If the soldier is in Kuwait or Mexico or Brazil or Taiwan, you don't have to have it. But if they're in one of those EU countries plus Norway plus Switzerland, you do have to have the harmonized code. Okay. The harmonized code is always 10 digits when you enter it in Postal Mate. That does not mean all harmonized codes are 10 digits. So when you look up the harmonized code, sometimes it'll come back as six digits. I've even seen them as four digits. Um, but what you'll do is add zeros to the end of it to make it correctly 10, 10 digits and enter it in postal mate. So if you looked up something and it came out to 6301.25, you would add zeros. So it would be 6301.25.000. It's always going to be uh, four numbers dot two numbers dot four numbers. I believe Postmate actually lets you enter it in without the dots. I always like adding the dots, but up to you. Um, be very careful there's no space in front of it. Um, if you do have a space in front of it, then you'll get back this funky little error in Postmate. It most often happens when you copy paste that there ends up a space in front of it. Um, if you have trouble with copy pasting it, you might just have to enter it in manually. I know it's not always as accurate and you could make a mistake, but you know, if all else fails, enter it manually. Next big change. Whew, I need a break. <laughs> Here we go. CMRA. Now, I did all of the international first because 99 I dare say 100% of you all ship international from your stores. I might have one or two of you that don't, but I think all of you do. Um, not all of you are have mailboxes in your store and deal with CMRAs. So I did all the international stuff first in case you needed to drop off um, because out of the all of our, our customer base, like I said, 99 or 100% need international maybe 97% need CMRA. So we're gonna get into the CMRA. Now I have to tell you that these, um, these rules are proposed. They were proposed in January. They were decided on in February. I have not been able to discover as of yesterday if they actually passed, but I have been told there was no reason they would not pass. Um, while they did have a comment time period where people could submit their comments, and by the way, the um, People over at RSA were very vocal about some of the, the concerns they had on your behalf for this. There wasn't really, um, it, the, the comments didn't really affect them. And they said flat out, we're gonna give a comment period because we think it's the right thing to do, but we're gonna vote on this regardless of what you think. And it was gonna get pushed through. So I am confident, um, quite confident, and confident enough to offer dinner to any, if I'm wrong, uh, to one of you, <laughs> if, if these didn't get passed. They're effective today. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, having said that, um, you 
cannot possibly possibly be in compliance today because none of the tools and things that we're going to talk about today are even available to you, which means the post office as of today is out of compliance. So are you. So there will be a time period, a huge grace period while this all rolls out. So don't freak out. You're going to freak out because there's some big changes coming. We're going to know more about these as they come out. Um, we, we haven't really seen any of these. All I've seen is the law. I have not seen any of the actual details or how it's going to be applied. I've gone through the law and step by step, and we're going to try to make this as non boring as possible. Um, and go through each of the changes. So the first one starts with the definition of the CMRA. Way back when they created the CMRA rules, I want to say that was 1999, I was two, um, the CMRA rules were really just about stores like you. But since then, we have had OBCs, which is office business centers, they had slightly different rules. And then we've seen virtual mailboxes come into play. Well, at this point, the post office says, no, 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 you're all under falling under these exact same rules. Everybody plays by the same rule books, doesn't matter how you do it. Um, so what we know is that for those of you who also have virtual mail, the, the rules are the same. Now, I want to point out the bottom thing here. Um, anytime uh, for the CMRA rules here, anytime you see white, I'm pulling that from the CMRA rules. Anytime you see black, that's Karen's interpretation or best advice or how she sees this, okay? Karen can be wrong. So, um, you know, always go by the white. We'll go by the black. And over time, as these come out, if we need to modify our opinion of anything or how these affect you, we will. So just have that in mind. I don't want you saying, but Karen said, no, Karen made it crystal clear what's the rule and what's what's the best available information so next thing is for you store owners uh you will you have completed a 1583 at your local post office in order to be a cmra you should have all done that way back in the beginning when you started or when you bought the business or when you took over the business or whatever um those will happen but now the post office will upload these to a new database called the CRD. That's called the Customer Registration Database. You're gonna see a lot about that um, over, over the next while. I've also heard it called something else, um, Facility Registration Database or something like that, something like that, close to that. But we're gonna go with CRD for, for the purpose of this webinar and see which acronym takes precedence later. So. If you're out of compliance, you, um, you will have 30 days to cure. That seems to be a theme throughout. You're going to see that periodically is the 30 days to cure. That does not mean the initial. You can't cure something, fix something in 30 days if you don't have the tools provided to you by the post office you need. So as a store owner, you might need to update um, the your, your CMRA stuff, your 1583A stuff with your local post office. That is a possibility. Now, you have to supply your own ID for this. At this time, I did not see anything specific in the rules that said that your ID will be scanned and be uploaded with that 1583. I'm, it is possible I missed it. It is also possible that they will start doing it anyway because they might be, they might think they should. So who knows how these, this will play out. Here's a new one. This is really weird, guys you have to complete a 1583 that's the the form that your customer fills out for yourself if you want to receive mail at your own business yeah so that rent statement and your utility bills and all those things that come in if they're in your name and oft times they are or whatever come, might come in your name you're going to have to fill out a 1583 for yourself same thing for your manager and your employees if they receive mail in their name at your store they have to now have a 1583. Um, I don't know what box number to you would assign. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave that up to you. I have some opinions, but I'm going to leave that up to you. So you have to complete a 1583. Now, here's the weird thing, or weird thing, the new thing, the, and it is weird. This customer registration database, you will be putting the information in the database. So it's not necessarily important that you have a 1583 filled out in Postalmate, it's important that it be in this database. 
I know what your next question is. Can't I put it in Postalmate and then Postalmate upload it to that database? No, <laughs> that's not happening. I'm not saying it will never happen, but here's, here's the reason. If you go to Costco and you buy a package of blueberries and you bring the blueberries to your store and it has a barcode on it and you scan the barcode, what happens in Postmate? Nothing. It doesn't bring up a price. The reason for that is because you have not programmed your end to match that barcode. That's why we can't upload it. We, we absolutely could create something to upload it, but they have to create something to receive that technology also. At this time, it's not even been released. We don't know what it looks like. We don't, we don't believe at this time it has that capability. This means that you will manually be entering the 1583s for every mail name in your store. For some of you, you have 300 rented boxes and there's average, an average of three mail names per box. You're going to be doing 900 of them. You're gonna be given some time to do this. But folks, it gets bigger. You also have to have current ID and you have to scan that ID and upload a picture of that ID. And on top of that, you have to keep a picture of that ID in your records. So, and it has to be in paper form, not electronic form. So you have to have a paper 1583 that's signed, the paper, a copy of the ID, and then you have to upload that ID to this customer registration database. I don't know yet what that looks like. We've not yet seen it, but this is new and this is big. You're going to have customers that are gonna say, oh, heck no, you're not uploading my ID to anything. And you know what you have to do? You have to say, I'm sorry. That's the only way you can rent a mailbox and get receive mail. And you will have to turn customers away from that because of this. Um, don't think that this isn't uh, uh, gonna be an issue. This is, this is an industry-wide issue, um, and I don't think there's really anything we can do about it. These rules are going to be heavily enforced once they're in place and actionable. And what I mean by that is they do have to give a significant period of time after they provide you with credentials for that customer registration database for you to enter all that stuff. I'm I'm guessing it's not it's not reasonable for that time period to be 30 days. I have stores that have 1,000, 1,500. I have one store, and I know who you are down south, that has 4,000 rented mailboxes. Can you imagine dealing with that, with all this, and they're going to have to do this? This means that every one of your customers is going to have to do a new 1583 because you're going to have to get the new ID. Part of that uploading it is you're going to be entering the expiration date on that ID. And I'm looking out on my, my side here where my question and answers, and you guys are just flying with the questions. I will try to get to questions. I don't necessarily have all the answers, guys. Um, I can only go off of what the rules currently state, not how they will actually be applied in reality. So um, you will have to complete this 1583 and upload your own ID and that of your employees and manager if they receive mail at the store. So I think I got a little ahead, but that's kind of what this one says also. So this is what you'll be doing for your customer. Now, the important thing is also you will need to keep your paper copies of the 1583 and ID for six months, after which I would think that the best policy would be to shred that or burn it, one or the other, so it's completely gone. Um, two years in California, by the way. So you required, that's a state law. That's not a federal law. State law in California says you keep those records for two years. Um, IDs must have the current name and address. This is tricky and I'm gonna tell you why. Um, I live in Arizona and we are nothing but the cowboy and rebel state. We do everything a little bit different. Um, we're state 48, which means we're one of the newer states, which means we didn't have a lot of inherited stuff from old days. But one of those things that we do is um, our driver's licenses, uh, we can get a driver's license at 21. That's, we can get one earlier, of course, but 21 is drinking age. So you can get a dr new driver's license at 21 and you do not have to renew that driver's license until you turn 65. So that means for, is that 44 years? I think, yeah, 44 years you could have the same driver's license and it would be perfectly valid 
even if you move 15 times in the state during that time, that same driver's license with your old college address at Arizona State University is still completely legal in Arizona. You do have to notify our motor vehicles department of your new address. That's a requirement but you don't have to have that reflected on your driver's license. I know it's really weird. We do weird things here. So this whole um, IDs must have current name and address. That means that in Arizona, for example, when you're opening a mailbox and you get somebody's ID, it's very possible that their driver's license doesn't have their current address on it. And that's a problem because one of the IDs is required to be a photo ID. And oftentimes a unless they have a passport a lot of times their driver's license is their only real photo id that's acceptable so it's going to be a bit of an issue now arizona is doing the real real ids for travel and stuff so that is changing over time but for example i have four count them four driver's licenses in my wallet right now and every one of them are legal four of them because arizona doesn't doesn't take back your old driver's license it's weird. I know we're weird. So just know that different states, it's going to be different. You, you know your state and what it looks like. But hey, somebody from Arizona could come to your state, right? <laughs> and I could have a legal, legal uh, driver's license, but I can't run a mailbox if it's not the same address as my real address. So um, I can't, at least I can't use that ID. So just know those things are happening. Um, minors still don't need to have a 15, fill out a 1583, so that's good. Spouses now have to have their own. That's always been the case in Postalmate, but if you ever went, had um, created 1583s manually, in the old days we did that a lot, it was legal for spouses to share a 1583. That is no longer true. All right. Um, you will also have to keep your customer's ID. So again, you're going to have to find a safe place for this. And a safe is the word. So you might want to have an, a, a, a safe in your building. Now, if you have a safe and it's the kind that I can pick up and carry out with me, that's not going to be terribly safe. Um, so it would need to be uh, a he really heavy safe or an in-floor safe, possibly an in-wall safe. One of my stores years ago, and I would, for those of you who don't know, I was a, a store owner, I had multiple stores. One of my stores moved into a place where a restaurant had been in previously, and they had a floor safe, one of those tubular floor safes. Now, I don't think it would have actually held all of these because it wasn't that big, but oh, that was lovely because I'll tell you what, there was no breaking into that safe. <laughs> You'd have to blow it up to get into that safe. It was lovely. So I really loved that. But yeah, so at the very minimum, at the very minimum, a big locking file ca cabinet, not the two drawer one on wheels because bad guy can wheel it out, right? <laughs> I'm talking about the really heavy four drawer one with a lock, uh, a good lock on it. You're gonna have to find something. You're gonna have to keep this stuff secure. Quarterly report changes. No longer are you going to have to print a quarterly report and submit it to the post office. Oh, by the way, on your 1583s, it may have said this, you don't have to hand those physically into your post office anymore. Everything is uploaded. You don't turn in anything to your post office ever again, which that's the nice part, right? Uh, it's the only nice part about this, honestly. So quarterly reports, you don't print them, you don't hand them in. You actually go to the customer registration database, the CRD, and you have to, there's, I'm assuming there's a button or somewhere where you push, and you have to actually certify, which means you have to agree legally that all of the IDs that you're submitting or all the, the IDs that you have on file are current. So every quarter, they're going to make sure that all the IDs that you have on file are not expired. So if you're reading between the lines, this lovely profit center called Mailboxes, which we have enjoyed for 40 years and has been relatively carefree and a moneymaker, is going to start having a cost associated with it in the form of maintaining records. Um, certainly initially there's a cost in, in, in the labor in getting all this uploaded, but then every quarter going through and making sure going through the list. And I'm hoping that the CRD has an easy way for you to see if any, any, um, expiration dates, um, are expired. So you can quickly get that. Now, I don't know about you. 
but I have at least once or twice before, okay, several times before, I had to go back to my current mailbox customers and say, I need an updated 1583 from you. When you tell them that, it's like they ghost you. They completely ghost you. Trying to get them to come in and do that is a real bear. And what you're going to end up doing, and this is horrible, what you're going to end up doing is withholding their mail. And that's, I, I'm telling you, this is, this is, you're going to have to do it. You're going to end up withholding their mail until they come in and complete that. Um, because you don't want to be on the wrong side of these new rules. Um, rules, by the way, when the post office has rules, those are laws. Those aren't just rules. They are actual laws. So um, at this point, we don't know if you're going to be printing really anything from Postalmate. Um, again, this is to be seen except for the contract and the California acknowledgement if you're in California. We'll get to that in just a minute. I don't know if the new CRD even allows you to print. Um, it may, it may not. I think it almost has to because when you're creating the 1583, they have to actually sign something. So I think it's going to have to, but again, we'll, we'll know more once we see what it looks like. If you have a bad box holder, and if you've been in business very long, you certainly have had one or two, and I've had several, um, and the post office catches wind of it, they now have more authority to stop the mail, and they want your help in that. And so they can direct you to withhold the mail from that box holder and return it to the post office. Having said that, my advice to you is to get that in writing. Don't just get a phone call and say, you're going to need to hold the mail all for Paul Smith in 234. Uh-uh. You send me something in writing with the, the chief postal inspector's signature on it, and I'd be happy to follow the rule. But make sure that you cover yourself on that. I don't anticipate that'll happen very often, but it does happen. We do have bad actors, and this is part of that to catch that. When you close a mailbox, you will now have to enter the termination date in the customer uh, registration database as soon as practical. And that's what the law actually says, as soon as practical. Now, here's the deal. I don't, we have that six month remailing period and that has not changed. And so when your customer closes a mailbox, you're supposed to continue to receive their mail for six months. And unless you have an agreement with your customer that says otherwise, um, you're gonna have to um, remail their mail to their last known address. Again, we'll get into that. So recording the actual termination date and having that date on file is important so that that six months starts because you want that six months to get over as quickly as possible. I don't know if there is what quote, a backdating thing. So let's say your customer stops to says, no, nope, February 28th is my last day. I'm, I don't want to be with you anymore. So, and you are out of town for a couple of weeks and you forget about it. And then all of a sudden, you know, April 15th comes up and you go, oh, I forgot to close his mailbox on February 28th. I don't know if the CRD is going to let you go back and enter February 28th, or if now you have to enter April 15th. So having said that, once you get into this program and we learn more about it, we'll find out, but hopefully it allows you to go back and actually date it for the date that he terminated. And let's face it, a lot of times you don't know your customer's gone until they just don't show up anymore and the mail's piling up. So whatever their last due date was, you know, uh, for mail, that would, you know, for uh, mailbox rental, that would be their termination date. So on your paper 1583, you do still have to write terminated on that and keep that in your files. And by the way, if you are not at your store all the time, your store employees are probably going to need to have access to that locking cabinet so they can get in there and update these records unless you are going to be wholly responsible for it and you have a method with them where they get you that information in a timely fashion and you can do it. So be thinking of the how the process will work in your operations. You do still have to remail mail um, during the six month period unless you have a clause in your contract. I did make sure that that clause is still part of the rules. It is as far as I can see. We'll see when it all gets written out. But as far as I can see, I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then you have not taken a certified um, CMRA course from one of the one of the the uh, industry leaders in this 
it, it, that we have, I highly recommend you take one from RSA. I, I have fully vetted that one. It's a good one. They're going to have to change it a lot this year. Um, but you are required by law, once your mailbox customer ends his relationship with you, to remail all his mail to the last known address or the address he provides you. And it has to be at your expense, unless you've collected money up front. But if you haven't, you have to do it at your expense uh, and, and send that to the last known address. Often that's the one on the 1583. Um, unless you have a contract. And Postmate has a contract and it has a clause. The last clause in the Postmate contract that's in there talks about this and makes it so you don't have to do this horrible thing at your expense. Um, but if you are not in the habit of getting your customers to sign a contract, then you're on the hook. And by the way, this is really important. It's one contract per mail name. It's not one contract per mailbox, okay? Because every mail name has to agree to that. So their signet, you have to have a contract with every mail name's signature on it. Um, do to do, do. I know lots of questions coming up. Um, this is a new change. So in the past, you are were obligate, obligated by law to receive all mail for your mailbox customers except restricted. And restricted mail, by the way, is defined here. And it's it's restricted mail was mail that re was only going to that addressee. So John Smith, box 234, and he has his wife and his kids and his company and his friends and whoever in that mailbox. Well, if you received a piece of restricted mail for John Smith, only John Smith was allowed to have it. And in the past, they had to sign in, I think it was box five of the 1583, if they wanted to be able you to collect um, restricted mail for them. Well, apparently that is going away and you are now going to be receiving all mail for your mailbox customers, including restricted mail, whether they want it or not. Now, in the past, and this is gonna shock some of you, again, if you've not taken a certified CMRI class, this is gonna be news to you. You've never had a choice about accepting uh, certified mail on your, for your customer. And I know half of you have been turning it away because your customer doesn't want certified mail and you hand it back to your postman and he takes it. So let me tell you the law and let me tell you practice. Law is that you are required to accept that and put it in your mailbox's customer, mailbox's box, whether they want it or not. They don't have the option of saying no. Okay, you are required to. In practice, your driver or carrier doesn't know that law. And if he allows you to return it, then return it. I, you know, that that's fine. Um, it's it's on him to not take it back. It's on him to know the rules or her. Uh, so, but just know that if these rules are become more widely known in the 300 million zillion postal employees that are out there and they all start understanding that you have to accept all mail, then you will have to accept all mail. If you have a mailbox customer and usually it's the guy that's in legal trouble and he does not want to receive certified mail under any circumstances, that's not a choice. That is not your choice and it's not his choice. That's part of being a CMRA is you accept all mail. All right, <laughs> no, don't read this, <laughs> do not read all this. So this is just one clause in the mailbox rules. And the white part is the new part they're adding. But the reason I put this clause up there is the italics part, and I know it's really hard, but it starts where my, oops, darn it. It starts right here where I'm circling. Hopefully you can see that. Um, it says this remailing obligation. And this is the part that I tell, tell you about. As long as you have an internal service agreement between the customer and the CMRA or separate document, you can get out of having to remail it. So that's the important part of that. Now, some of you really want to know all these rules for yourself. And these are, the right-hand side is the new rules um, written as legalese, if you will. The left-hand side are the um, forms of ID, the rules on the forms of ID. So some of you may want to, want to do that. Well, I made it easy for you. I've even got notes. You can see my notes on this. I'll give you my notes on this. They are, for those of you who are, um, 
logged in live to this webinar, you will see on your dashboard a handout. You can click on that and it should download to your computer. If you're on your phone, or if you're not on something where you can't print something out or download something, that's fine. Don't have a panic attack. You can still get them. They are on our website right now in our help center. So if you go to our website and it's postalmate.com slash support, go to our help center, just type in CMRA. You don't have to log into our website. Just type in CMRA in the help center and you're going to get and there they are. You can see they both say March 2023. Those are the two cheat sheets you need if you want to read the rules yourself. I especially encourage you to do so on the ID. Knowing exactly what ID is allowed is really important. And I even highlighted that for CMRA so you can see it quickly instead of having to go through all, all of it. I've, I've done all the hard work for you. Uh, to make it easy. And who knows, you may find something I missed. It's not entirely impossible that you find something that I missed. Other stuff. Just, um, just know this, my postal mate, and I say mine because I love them, but our postal mate support team does not have training in things outside of postal mate. Virtually Everything we've talked about today is not Postmate. There's no button that you can push in Postmate to make this magic happen. Um, other than if you need help finding the harmonized code button on the on the custom, I don't think you need help with that. So please, please, please don't contact our support team with questions about how, you know when am I going to get the CMRA database? When am I going to get you know how do I know if this is allowed in that country? Those are not Postmate questions. When we do webinars, we teach for the whole industry, for the operations, for everything you need. When you call our support team, you are asking about something specific in Postalmate. So please don't ask things of them that they're not trained for. Um, I, I don't want to train them for that. They are specific to Postalmate and they know a whole lot more about Postalmate itself than I ever will. So please contact them. They love to help you. They, they, they really do. They really love you guys. Um, and they love to help you with Postmate. But these industry important things that we talk about in these webinars, the trainings that I do frequently have not really, this is for whatever software you, you use. It has, it's not specific to Postmate. So please don't reach out to them for that. If you have questions regarding some of the things I've talked about today, here's what you should do. First of all, read the rules. Second of all, talk to the carrier if it's an international question. Third, if you belong to a franchise, talk to them because they usually have the answers or some best practices and or reach out to RSA. Um, they are the industry experts. They are wonderful at helping out. If you are not a premium member with them, become a premium member with them. It's well worth the little amount you spend uh, to get all of the help that they provide. So take a look at that. Um, but those are those are the places to go. Karen cannot answer all of your questions. <laughs> I always get bombarded and I love you guys, so it's really okay, but I always get bombarded and it takes me two weeks to catch up in emails after a webinar. This one I have a feeling will be no different. Um, let's talk about UPS Access Point real quickly. So many of you know that we have developed an integration with UPS Access Point. We've talked about it in previous webinars. We are rolling that out. So if you have not received an email invitation to join that, that's fine. Um, it has only been made available currently to, an, to our beta group, to Annex Brands franchisees, and Package Hub Business Center franchisees. That's it. That's all we have released an email to. So if you don't belong to one of those and you haven't got an email, then that's correct. You will get an email invitation. However, we are putting it on pause because we have found that UPS has some issues that they're working out. We had a meeting with them this week. Um, they, whether you use the integration in Postmate or not, you've probably gotten some errors in Access Point this week. And those errors indicate that something to the effect of you need a valid tracking number or valid label, um, and it's rejecting the label. And what they did was they added some logic, and that's a technical word for programming. They added some logic because they were concerned about um, labels being reused. So for example, um, let's just say Zappos. 
I bought a pair of shoes with Zappos. I'm returning them. I print out the label and return it. Three months later, I buy another pair of shoes from Zappos. They don't fit either. I have big elephant feet. So I have to send it back. And instead of going and getting a new label, I just reprint the old label and use the same label. That's the kind of thing they're trying to stop. The problem is the logic that they added, they made some, they have they have to do some cleanup on it. They have to make some adjustments on it because I had one customer that said that um, they had a hundred labels rejected. And I don't know if it was this issue or a different issue, but it is frequent. We're getting a lot of calls on it and we can't do anything about it. So what I want you to do is contact, if you have that happen, contact Access Point directly and let them know because Honestly, they don't know how big of an issue this is unless they hear from you. If they only hear about one or two, they're thinking, yeah, you know, we're probably doing okay. It's only had a couple of, you know, issues. If you've had this issue, they need to know about it. So they need to know, oh, no, we're getting a lot of calls on this. This is something we need to take care of right away. So be, be sure and add that. The other thing that concerns me with this is let's say you do get that package from somebody who's dropping off his Apple shoes. and um, and it has a bad label. What do you do with the package now? It doesn't have a valid label. I mean, you can give it to the carrier, but you're not going to get your, your compensation for it. And that's not in, in my world. That's not right. You've handled the package as your contract with UPS says, but yet you have necess not necessarily any method of getting a hold of the sender. There might or might not be an, a, a phone number on it. Uh, and really, that's not your job to be the label police. You're just supposed to accept them, enter them, hand them to the carrier. Done, right? So I do have some concerns with this. So letting Access Point know um, that this is a concern of yours also. Also talk with um, your franchise if you have concerns on this. And because because big voices always matter than one little voice, or lots of voices always matter, right? Okay. So. Finally, we are gonna to get to our questions in a moment. Just in case, if any of you are not currently a Postalmate customer, um, come visit uh, our uh, us by calling or emailing. It's amazing. What we're finding out is that people watch the webinars on our website that don't yet use Postalmate. So I want to invite you to watch the webinars that we have posted on YouTube, but also um, if you're not yet a Postalmate customer, and you're thinking about having a retail shipping store, this is the place to uh, get signed up. So we would welcome you. Having said that, we're gonna go to the questions. And I can tell you there are already hundreds of questions. So I'm going to try to scroll through. And I don't think if I put the questions over here, I don't think you can see that list of questions. I think it hides, the webinar program hides it. Question about, you know what, this is, not related to what we talked about, but it, it's a question that many of you have. So I'm just going to address this elephant that is always in the room. Your UPS driver may now start not scanning packages when they're leaving your store. Some of you, many of you, they never did. But some of you, your UPS driver did scan them and they're no longer scanning them. There's nothing that can be done about that. That's UPS's policy is your driver does not have to scan them. Now, your driver may say something to the effect of, well, you should have a barcode that I can scan that will upload all of them. Well, unfortunately, your driver doesn't know what he's talking about. That barcode is only for um, people that use their WorldShip software. It's not for anybody who's using their API. UPS API doesn't give that option. So if they ever did, well, we could do it. Now you might say, well, Postalmate, why don't you create a barcode? Well, this is back to the Blueberry situation. We can create a barcode, but when he scans it, nothing's gonna happen on their end. And so what difference does it make, right? So it is up to UPS to create a barcode that we can implement, or you're gonna have to figure something out. My recommendation personally is cameras, cameras, cameras. You should have a boatload of cameras in your back room or wherever your drivers take packages so you can see from the camera what packages were placed in their pile and what packages they took out the door. Um, you do not want a $3,000 package to go missing because it wasn't scanned. So I'm not saying it'll happen. I'm just saying it's, an, it's a concern. So um, Mark, I don't have answers for that. 
Uh, he, Mark is asking great questions about how businesses are affected in the new 1583 format um, uploading in the customer re registration database. Until we see that customer registration database and see what the place looks like to enter a business, I can tell you this. Businesses do not rent mailboxes. People do. Okay. That's a hard and fast. So if you have ABC Construction Company come into your store and they say, yeah, we want to open up a mailbox for ABC Construction Company. You don't open it up for ABC Construction Company. You open it up for that person and he can add that company under his name. But basically the rule is the post office has to be able to arrest a person if they're a bad actor, not a company. So having said that, Again, many of these things we won't know until we see this customer registration database. I have heard through the grapevine that they are going to roll out the customer re registration database in bits, maybe to a state or an area, maybe a regional area at a time, don't have any idea where, and roll it out. And by summer, supposedly, it might go out to all. Now, I work in technology. I know what kind of delays happen in technology. It would not shock me if by the end of the year, we were still not using the, the CRD, the customer registration database. I'm hoping I'll be surprised, but I know technology. Please don't panic and think that you have to be using this immediately. You do have to use it as soon as you are given information, but that information should be provided to you, I believe by your local post office based on the 1583A on file. So um, what about a customer with ID, customer ID with a PO box for the address? No can do. Their, the, their, their ID has to have their home address on it, where they sleep. Again, where the po postal inspector can go and arrest them. That's what they really want. I mean, don't say that to your customer. Please don't say that to your customer. But that's really what they're looking for, guys. Okay, oh my gosh. Hold on to your horses. I'm gonna try to, and this, this jumps around, so I'm gonna try to go back through. Um, do, do, do. I'm getting, okay. If a customer buys something, I don't have an answer for this, is, but this is a good question, so I'll address it. Um, I, if a customer buys something in the EU or UK and sends it back, is it going to need an EORI? I don't think so. That's not really a trade. You know, this is it's not a sale. Okay, so I think that could go without an EORI, but that's Karen's educated opinion. That is not law. I have not seen that written yet, so I'm not com convinced that's how it will be. Um, let's see here. Uh, EORI, goods or only documents as well? Well, it's only on things in a sale or samples. So generally, that's not going to be documents. Generally, that's only going to be goods. Um, what happens if a customer wants their money back if the EORI is not... A, able to provide. I'm not sure what you're asking there. At this time, there is a lookup, by the way, for the UK EORI. I haven't seen one for the EU. It probably exists out there, but this is really important. It's kind of like the VAT tax. This is not your job. This is your customer's job to know this. If they're in trade with somebody in the EU, then they should have this information. Um, so please don't get bogged down in things that are not your complete responsibility. Your responsibility is to ask for it. Your responsibility is not necessarily to look it up. Okay. Uh, did it do? If you came in late to the webinar, please, instead of me repeating things, please go back and rewatch it. I'm not going to go over and add things. Oh. So I, I'm going to address something completely off topic. Thank you, David, for bringing up this whole thing. And this is the GAP program with Indicia. So many of you have printed a label, usually international, um, but a label, and it says it's going to, and instead of going to Italy or to Canada, it's going to a, a 
coastal processing facility in New Jersey or Los Angeles, or one of, I think there's one to say there's six or eight of them around the country and not to the, to the name and address that you created the label for. And you might scratch your head and go, what? And you may have called us up and said, you know, what is that? I'm going to tell you a horror story that happened. And I'm going to repeat this story in the future. I'm going to give you a recommendation up front that you contact Indisha. And unless you want to be in the GAP program for some reason, that you tell them you want to be opted out of this program for every single service. They will argue with you. They will stalemate you because they make extra money on this, but that you want out. And I'm going to tell you this horror story. I had a store recently who was trying to send back, send um, cremated remains, family, you know, of a, of a person, deceased person to Canada. That's perfectly legal. It has to go Express Mail International. So they did. And the customer paid for it to go Express Mail International. It went in an Express Mail International box. There's actually a special box for it. And it says Express Mail Cremated Remains. It's really cool. The label that printed out went to the processing facility. And the method to get it from the store to the processing facility is priority mail. That's against postal regulations. So it went out and it came back to the store. And the store said, what's up with this? I, and it confused them. So they did it again. And again, it printed out this lousy processing facility. And it went to the post office. And the post office rejected it. It said, no, you can't have a priority mail label on an express mail box. That's not going to happen. Um, and they're right. They're absolutely right. And it was because Indicia took over because they make more money doing it this way and went through this processing facility. So if you want to opt out of that, you contact Indicia and say, I do not want to participate in the GAP program. That's the Global Advantage Program for, for this store, for any service. And then you won't get those processing facilities. So I hope that helps you. Um, USPS does now require harmonized codes for those countries. New changes. How do we enter the 1,000 plus mailbox holders in the CRD database? Will this be done manually? Yes. If they develop something where we can upload stuff, we will. But remember, you now have to have copies of current ID for each of your box holders. And very few of you have that because it's not been required in the past. So if you have that, um, you're going to have to upload that. Um, do we have to tell the customer that their information will be uploaded to the database? Hmm. I don't, there is no, rec there is no law that says you have to. I'm going to leave it there. Um, if I have people that don't have a mailbox, but just receive packages, if it's mail packages, they have to have a 1583. If it's UPS, FedEx, DHL, on track, Amazon, you do not need to have a 1583 unless it comes through mail. Okay. Um, how does 15, the new 1583 requirement affect minors? Not at all. Uh, in Oregon, they are no longer giving out address change stickers or new ID. How will that look if they don't match. If the ID doesn't match, then you can't use that ID. That's just the law. It's federal law now. Uh, passport will work. And a passport, if my memory serves, looking at my passport, does not have an address. So a passport is perfect for the photo ID. And then you're going to need a second ID with the home physical address on it. And there's a lot more IDs that can qualify as a second ID than the first ID. Print out that form, CMRI, CMRA ID, and you'll see exactly what IDs are allowed. Please, please educate your staff on this. Um, all right. We can hold, withhold mail without being sued, question mark. Yes. Well, let's face it. Anybody can sue anybody for anything. So no, anybody can sue you. Can you withhold mail without a successful lawsuit? If the post office directs you to hold mail and you do, then you are you are legally, in my opinion, uneducated, uh, indemnified. By the way, you can withhold mail for non-payment. When mail arrives to your store, 
it is now personal property. It is no longer considered mail. You could technically open it up and read it. In fact, many people do for virtual mail or for um, uh, scanning it and emailing it to customers. That's service. Um, there's a PictaMail has a, has a service. You're welcome this year. <laughs> PictaMail has a service for your current box holders where it allows you to scan the email, scan the, the letters or email the, the uh, mail and collect fees for that. So um, yeah, so you can do that, but you could even do it without their permission. Now, could they sue you? Yes, but there's no postal law against it. Might there be something else that they could win with? Possibly. Um, and where is the CRD? Now that's a really good question. They have not released the CRD yet. So I've never seen it. I only know it exists it, right now. It's what we call um, vapor, vaporware or vapor uh, software. Um, it, it's out there, but um, they say it exists, but we haven't seen it yet. So we'll, we'll know when you, you'll know when we know. We're, we'll know when you know. Um, I assume we're looking at in the next few weeks, some store somewhere is going to start using it if they're on the, on the ball. But again, I work in technology and I know how these things can get delayed really, uh, you know, for a long time. What if one of the names on the mailbox is a company? Any changes th for this? There's no ID for a company. We'll have to see with the CRD and see how that works out. Um, you should, in my opinion, be able to add a company to a person's information. So if I have John Smith and I have his driver's license and I have his, some, you know, his bank statement, those are his IDs. And then he also has a business and there's no IDs for the business, of course, but I have IDs on the person. That's how it should work. We'll see in reality what happens when it does. Um, okay. And this, this horrible thing, bear with me here. Um, can the Postmate implement a feature that lists expired IDs every quarter? Well, I suppose it can, but then you also have to enter it in Postmate. See, here's the question. Are we going to be entering, and we don't know this yet, is it going to be necessary to, to enter any information in Postmate regarding 1583s or ID in the future? It may not. You may be only entering it in, you'll, you'll open the mailbox in Postmate, You'll enter the 1583 and upload the IDs through the CRD, and you'll get the contract and the California acknowledgement if you're in California through Postal Mate when you open the box. So that may be the process. We'll know more in the future. When we get it all figured out, when we see the CRD, we'll have an updated webinar to, to um, spell out some best practices and some ideas. Um, Janet, unless you are part of a franchise, you cannot at this time. Um, don't we need a notice or directive from the USPS about changes? Um, actually, no. They are not required to notify you about changes. Um, they are only required to publish it, which they are doing. Um, it is published. So uh, it's up to you as a store owner to know what the changes are. And that's why I do these webinars, because you don't have time to keep up on all, all this stuff. Uh, so no, they are not required to let you know. Now, when the CRD comes around, I do believe they're going to be required to, because they're going to have to give you access to that. So they are going to be required to get a hold of you at that point in time. Uh, how can virtual mailbox services comply with the new rules? Um, they are under the same CMRA rules as actual mailboxes. So we will see how that shakes out. I cannot speak for them. You'll have to speak directly to whatever virtual mailbox provider uh, you work with. Um, but you are under the same obligations, whether it's a physical mailbox or a virtual mailbox. Um, what can we do now to implement the mailbox changes? You know. Um, if you collect the ID, the 1583 and collect copies of the ID knowing what's coming, you probably at you know, probably then when it is implemented, won't need to have that person come in and re-get re all that information. I'm saying that with the belief, might be a fairy tale, with the belief that you'll actually be entering in the CRD in the next few months. It could be a year from now and that ID might be expired by then. So <laughs> we'll see. Um, again, very helpful here. 
Who enters the information to the CRD, us or the digital mailbox company? You are legally responsible for it. So I'm not saying that they won't, but they would have to have the credentials for your store and do it. So my guess is it'll be you. I don't know how that's going to work out. Again, for virtual mailboxes, you're going to have to speak with your, your and, and they're waiting for the CRD too. I don't know that they've seen it yet either. So we will know more. So again, and for the passport, that's a, that's can, that will work for a photo ID. And then you have to have, a, always have to have a second ID anyway, that will have to have their home address on it. Um, military IDs are a little bit sketchy. So here's the issue with that. I'm sketchy. That was a poor choice of words. I'm sorry. Um, the rules are sketchy regarding military IDs. There we go. That's better. Military IDs, from my understanding, and you veterans and active service members can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that federal law states that you cannot copy military ID. So if that's true, and military IDs are currently an acceptable form of ID for a 1583, you're in a quandary. So Having said that, I'm going to wait for the post office to give us further enlightenment regarding how to handle this. They're either going to have to stop allowing 15 air military IDs for a, for a CMRA, which is really going to anger a lot of veterans, or they're going to have to say, yeah, you got to copy everything except military IDs, or they got to get the military to change their minds on this. And I don't think that's happening. Um, Trey, no. Yes, but no. It's it's very limited, and that's not going to be the answer uh, on that check mark. Uh, should we accept packages that are in a UPS envelope but had a, has a FedEx label? Wow. Um, they run. It runs a risk. You know, FedEx and UPS. It's just not a good idea. It's it's just not a good idea. Here's I honestly, if it's a drop off, look, I'm not the drop off police. It's a really bad idea. It can easily get put in the wrong bucket in your store and taken by the wrong carrier. But let's say it gets out there. I would say if that customer comes in and they have a UPS envelope with a FedEx label, hand them a blank or an empty FedEx envelope for next time. And say, look, if you need one, just bring the label here with the item and I'll provide you a label. But don't this the carriers really get upset when you do this. But you know, it's not again, you're not the package police. So I don't know that there's a carrier, there's probably a carrier rule on that, but it is what it is. Um Maggie, it, they can't have conflicting addresses. So the two IDs cannot have conflicting addresses. If they both have the address, they both have to be um, the current address. If you use a passport that doesn't have an address, and then you only have to deal with one address ID. Um, all right. Do, 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 do. Again, a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, questions. If you have not yet taken a certified course in CMRA, I highly recommend it. It's like a three-hour course, soup to nuts in this. Um, so if you go to any events, then do that. Mr. or Mrs. Arapaho, exactly what would you like us to do with those codes? And if you can explain that, then I'll answer that question. So be very specific, and I'll answer that question. Um, can we add business names to a customer's mailbox after they've opened the initial box without ID for the mail business itself? I think so. I mean, currently you can. With the new rules, we'll have to see what the CRD looks like. So under the current circumstances, the answer is yes, you can add. If I have John Smith that has a mailbox and he started with me four months ago and he comes in tomorrow and says, I would like to add a business to that, you should be able to do that without taking ID because you already have his ID. So it's adding a business. That should be okay. Um, the key again is just making sure you have that ID. Oh, my finger. I'm holding the mouse button down so I don't lose my place in scrolling the questions and it hurts. Um, uh, Aftabali. That's coming. Um, I'm sorry if I mis mispronounced your name. I, and I apologize. Some of you have names that are unfamiliar to me and I might mispronounce them and I do apologize for that. Uh, yeah, so Cecilia, that that's good. Um, I, I have heard that this is rolling out mid-year also. 
Um, I, again, working in technology, I'm going to put a question mark in that. Mid-year is very broad, by the way. Mid-year to me is anywhere between May and, and September, right? So we'll see if they actually hit that target. Um, and they anticipate a nine-month uh, implementation. I think that's um, possible. I think it's optimistic. Um, we'll see how much, how, I don't know if they understand how many man hours um, the post office is going to have to put on this to make this successful. We'll see, and we'll see. <laughs> so could an unhoused person then claim we are discriminating if we don't open a mailbox? Well, I suppose they could, um, but you are following federal law, so you don't have choices in it. So that will protect you. Unhoused people, however, do have an option for getting mail at their post office. So, um, and I know this for a fact because when in the past big hurricanes happen or natural disasters, but hurricanes was the circumstance and Katrina is the one that comes to mind and it hit New Orleans and a lot of people were displaced. Whole communities moved out and moved to different states even um, as a community practically. And you had all these people that needed mailboxes and our stores could not rent to them because they didn't have current address and ID that reflected that. The post office said that, yes, but you can get your mail at the post office and they provided a way. So yeah, so again, not every, er, not every potential mailbox customer is um, gonna be your mailbox customer, that is a fact. If there is general delivery, but there is a special circumstance where they can be assigned a mailbox. Um, so no, yes, for the time being, continue. <laughs> that's a good question, Andrew, good question. So because you do not yet have access to the CRD, should you still give quarterly reports to your postmaster? And should you, should you still give the 1583s to your postmaster? The answer is yes. Should you give copies of ID to your postmaster? No, 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 no. The only place those customer IDs go are uploaded to the CRD and in your file cabinet. That's it. If you start handing out your customers' IDs, oh my gosh, and there's some part-time postal worker that grabs it and takes off with it, oh my gosh, so no. <laughs> The, the customer registration database is that way because they believe it's completely safe. They're encrypting it. They're doing all these things that are supposed to keep it relatively safe. We know from how many data leaks there are, how safe that might be, but it won't be your responsibility. Please don't make those IDs a bigger liability to you than they already are going to be. That's Karen's opinion, but yeah. Um, will any of these changes affect contract postal units differently than the regular post office? I don't think so. Um, if you are a CMRA, if we're talking about CMRA, um, some contract postal units are also a CMRA. Some contract postal units have official post office mailboxes. Um, so there might be different rules for those. By the way, these rules do not necessarily affect when you go and rent a mailbox at your local post office. They don't necessarily at this time, to my knowledge, have to do any of this. And they, they may, may or may not have to upload anything or take IDs. So this is part of the concerns that your industry professionals have on your behalf, that they's lo they've lodged these complaints, that it, um, pro it, it gives an unfair advantage to the post office on renting mailboxes. Guys, that's not an accident. <laughs> Just my opinion again. Sorry. I'm way too opinionated, aren't I? Um, the requirement to download, I think you mean upload, ID to the, to the website has to be a privacy violation, unconstitutional. I, I, that's out of my league. I'm not a lawyer. So yeah, um, <laughs> there's all kinds of of things here that concern me. Um, yeah. <sighs> what happens when we don't have a 1583 for a customer or it's not uploaded on the CRD um, when we get their mail or UPS or FedEx packages? Please keep the two separate. Mail is the only thing affected by these rules. You can accept UPS, FedEx, DHL, OnTrack, LSO, 
graffiti, Amazon, and without any 1583 or anything on any information on the customer. That is your decision as a store owner. The only time these rules come into play is when the mailman touches it. Okay, so that's it. Uh, Michaela, they have to have one. So the question is about uh, RVers. What if they don't have a physical address? First of all, they generally have to have one for their vehicle registration. They generally have to have, and licensing, they generally have to have one for their insurance. Um, and okay, yeah, I guess it could be a PO box, but they, you have to have one. Um, if you don't have a physical address for them, then you don't rent to an RVer. That's just law. So 1583s for employees of mailbox holders. If they receive mail in their name, yes, they will have to. Ha they will be be an additional mail name. By the way, this is a super opportunity, super time to implement an additional fee for additional mail names. Because once you're doing this. And you're going to tell your you're going to tell your customers you're going to be really smart and word these things. You're going to tell your customers, post office is imposing new regulations. You you have ten days to come in and and complete a new 1583. You need two forms of ID. It needs to look like this. And by the way, you need one for you need everybody who receives mail in your home over the age of 18 needs to do this or in your home or business. Or and we will not be able to give you the mail. This is the time to get more strict on that and start collecting fees for additional mail names. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, I wanted to see if we got an update because I kind of picked on Arapaho to see if they are able to give me any more information and I don't see it. Uh... <laughs> Can you guys tell I really, I mean, I went through these legal things like crazy trying to get this as good as I could. And I have no doubt that I have misspoken somewhere and I will have to come back in a future webinar and correct this. And that's why signing up for these webinars is so important. And I knew this webinar would run over. This is maybe one of the biggest webinars I've ever done as far as information. This is a loaded webinar because everything went effective today, even though the post office new rules they're effective today, but really not, right? So, okay, I think there is, is there an online course for CMRI certification? Um, no, there isn't. Please don't confuse that with certified mail. If you're interested in learning about certified mail through Postmate, we have a webinar on that. It's available on YouTube and it's available on our website. You never have to log into our website to access our past webinars or, or videos or tech notes. So, um, or the help center. So just go to our website, postmate.com slash support for that, or look it up on YouTube. A great um, preview, I'll probably update that one, but the information really hasn't changed. Um, I've just gotten older, so I'll update it with new wrinkles in the future um, for certified mail, so that's great. But the question was, is there an online course that it, for certified CMRA regulations, blah, blah, blah. To my knowledge, there is not yet. RSA has been working on that, it's a big, I know I know that it's a very high level of importance to them. It's just a real bear to deal with and they have they have struggled getting it launched. So I'm hoping that it will happen soon. Uh, they very, very much want to, and that would be the organization that would do that. Also, if you belong to a different franchise, like um, if you are Annex Brands, they have super instructors with um, uh, CMRA. I know that uh, Dan Cox, Jerry Berry keep up on all of this stuff and they are amazing. Um, the other instructors, Jim Bloom, um, Zach, these guys, they're fabulous. So uh, for you Annex Brands people, you've got a great team on your side because every time I've talked to them about stuff like this, they already knew it. So they're they're really up on this stuff. So between the two, for those of you, you, you've got resources besides Karen, I'll help you wherever I can. Oops, there we go. Well, that was a mess. I'll go through that again. Uh, do, 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 do. There we go. Okay. I'm messing things here. Yeah, questions. We were back to questions. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. 
<laughs> through a lot of things you didn't need to see there. Okay, we're just about to wind down. You guys do have stores to get to, and um, I have meetings to get to, but I hope that you really got something out of this. Again, please don't turn down packages because you don't have an EORI. Just be sure to ask for it when you think it might be needed, but go ahead and ship it. As time goes on, we will certainly learn more information and pass it on when they, you know, and, and learn from each other. When you learn something new, please don't hesitate to email me, karen at pcsynergy.com, and that will be soon, karen.grant at maersk.com, M-A-E-R-S-K, um, and would say, hey, this happened to me, and, and it went like this, and the CRD did this, and it asked for that, and my postmaster said this, and, you know, I may even call you and talk to you, talk to you about it, um, but it's like that gap one with the cremated remains. Had that customer not reached out to us, I would have never known and I could never have taught that. And it was a really valuable lesson because that's something that can happen in any one of our stores. And that poor family that had to wait for the remains through two return packages must have been terribly on edge. Um, they were in Canada. They must have been thinking the, the United States was nuts and they were probably right in that circumstance. So. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I get smart from two things. One, I study really hard, but two, and the most important one is I learn from you guys. You guys share your experiences and I learn valuable things that I can turn around and teach. So thank you for that. Um, just looking really quickly. <sighs> Agnes, we will find out about the CRD when the post office alerts you. We won't know because that we believe that they'll be rolling it out in areas and we have no idea what area we'll have it first. So um, that will come. And person who just wrote in, and I'm not going to slaughter your name, <laughs> about UPS, we, we believe that you will receive an email if you don't belong to a franchise, an email invitation to the integration. The Postmate integration with UPS Access Point is still um, in beta, but we do have the franchises using it. It is not available to everybody yet because UPS is having some issues that they're working out. When they have confirmed to us that they have fixed those issues, we will send you an email. We hope it will be in, in March. Uh, oh, Holly, I don't know where your first part of your question went. Oh, if you cancel that gap program, then your label just comes out straight to where it was supposed to go, like a regular label. It just doesn't go to that horrible processing facility. Um, that was a, my understanding, and I could be wrong on this, but my understanding is that this is a program that the Indicia worked out with the post office, the Global Advantage Program gap where they said, hey, we'll handle the brokering of these packages and we'll relabel it and stuff and you can send it here and you can pay us this fee and then you don't have to do it. And they make money doing that. Um, and it saves maybe saves the post office a little money. They make money doing, doing it, um, extra money on it. So they want you to do it. In fact, my understanding is they may even argue with you when you call them up and say, I don't wanna be in the GAP program anymore. Um, so. So you're going to have to contact them to opt out. Uh, there, Alex asks, how do we change the certified layout for the post office? There's no layout changes. If you want a layout change, you have to talk to the post office. They'll have to direct it, direct, make direct. When I say post office, I mean the people in Washington, D.C., which isn't going to happen, right? Um, and they have to direct Indicia to make a change. In other words, the label is exactly the way Indicia wants it. They create it, and it's exactly where the post office tells them to create it. So I know it's inconvenient. By the way, if you are doing a certified label and you are not using a 3800N sticker on that, shame on you. You have not watched the webinar I did on certified mail. Go watch the webinar on certified mail. I'm not saying you, Alex. I'm saying so it, I'm, this is general for everybody. You probably are doing it perfectly. Um, global post and gap are not the same thing. GAP is the Global Advantage Program. Okay. Uh, and it's an Indicia program, not a USPS program. All right, I think we're done. All right, if there's something I missed, um, 
and, and you feel it's really important, you can email me. Bear in mind, it could take a couple of weeks for me to get back to you because I, I, after these webinars, not only do I have my regular job, but I get tons of, of questions. So I, I will try to get back to you. I'll do my best to get back to you. Um, thank you very much for joining. I hope that you have a wonderful week. We will have some follow-ups to this. Oh, and by the way, um, I'll send, be sending the email later today um, with the the link to this recording. And so it'll be late today. It won't be early today. It'll be late today so that you can rewatch it, have your employees watch. You can go back and, and see the things you missed, whatever. So again, thank you very much. Take care, everybody. And bye-bye.